Welcome back, everyone. Today was Tuesday. So what does that mean? It means, of course, I was competing in Title Tuesday, a prize event that is held on chess.com every single week. Now, it is held not once, but two times. So there are two chances to win with a grand prize of 1,000 in each event. Now, this is the marquee event on chess.com. It's been around for a very long time. And last week, I won my 49th Title Tuesday in the early morning edition. I was not able to win in the evening edition. And today, I did not win in the morning edition. So I was going to try to do my best to make it 50 in this evening edition on February 28th. Now, I played very well throughout the event. I drew against Ali Reza Faruja, a top five player in the world, the world champion Magnus Carlsen as well. Nonetheless, going into the final round of this event, I had a score of eight and a half out of 10 points. I had three draws against God Kamsky, Ali Reza Faruja, Magnus Carlsen, as, as I mentioned a second ago. But there were two players ahead of me. There was Ali Reza Faruja and there was Magnus Carlsen, both on nine points. So without further ado, going to this final game, I wanted to win and hope that neither Ali Reza nor Magnus could win. Now let's go here and we'll start this game. I played against Beck in 95. I had the white pieces, but before we get into that, let me show you the standings here going to the final round. Now, as you can see, Magnus Ali Reza on nine out of 10, I'm on eight and a half out of 10, but there is one thing that matters here, which is that when you look at the tiebreaker to the left of the score, you'll see that my tiebreaker is 70. Ali Reza is 64.5 and Magnus Carlson's is 56.5. So what does this mean? Also looking below, none of the players on eight and a half were even remotely close to my tiebreaker. So this means that if I win my game, I am almost guaranteed to win the event if Ali Reza and Magnus Carlsen do not win. Now, Matt, Ali Reza Faruja drew his game very quickly. Magus's game would go a long time, but obviously we're going to focus on my game first. So in this last round, I'm playing with the white pieces against Becca95. This is Alexander Indigic, a very strong grandmaster from Serbia who I played in the World Rapid and Blitz, just checking the flag to make sure, who I played in the World Rapid and Blitz not so long ago in Kazakhstan. So I start by playing e4 in this game. He plays e5, and now I play bishop c4, essaying a version of the bishop's opening or the Vienna, depending on what black setup is. He goes knight f6. I play d3 to guard the pawn on e4. He plays knight c6. Now I develop this knight to prevent black from playing d5 and playing in the center immediately. Knight a5 is played here, and now I go queen to f3. Now, at first glance, this looks really weird for a couple of reasons. First of all, after knight takes bishop, pawn takes bishop, black has two bishops for a bishop and a knight. So black has the bishop pair first and foremost. Now, if you've watched a lot of my videos, you'll definitely have heard me say that stronger players really like the bishop pair. Bishops are generally considered to be a little bit better than knights. So why am I giving up the bishop pair so early? That's the first thing. The second thing is I have these pawns that are stacked on c4 and c2. However, there is a good justification for this, for allowing this to happen. First of all, black is going to have a very hard time pushing this pawn to d5 here because I have a lot of control over the square. I have uno, dos, tres, quattro pieces that are preventing black from being able to push d5. Secondly, I have very easy development by moving knight, my knight to e2 and castling the king out of the center right away. So the game continues with d6. I play knight g e2. Now d6 is maybe a little bit dubious. Probably black should bring the bishop out first and then play d6 here so the bishop is outside of this pawn chain. Perhaps a little bit better than playing d6 right away because while you try to bring this bishop out into the game, now your bishop is behind the pawn wall and you either have to go to e7 or you have to go to g7 here. So I play knight g2. We get c6 here. Now I decide to castle, and it just plays bishop e6, targeting this pawn on c4. I play b3, preventing him from capturing the pawn, and now he goes g6. It's worth noting if black tries to play d5 here, this is actually a big blunder, because after pawn takes, pawn takes, pawn takes. If black takes with the knight, I have rook d1, pinning the knight on d5. If black plays knight takes knight, I simply take the queen with check, and after rook takes rook, I go knight takes, and there's no checkmate on d1, and I simply have one queen for a lone rook, so I would be completely winning. After pawn takes, bishop takes, which is another variation, I can go queen to g3 here. And black has big problems. First of all, he can't move the bishop because then he loses his pawn on g7. And if he doesn't move this bishop, it's very hard to guard this pawn on e5. If black plays a move like queen c7, I can now go knight to b5, hitting the queen. He has to probably go to b8 to keep an eye on this pawn on e5. And now after bishop to b2, black really doesn't have a good way to guard this pawn, and white should be completely winning. So... Indigish doesn't play d5, he plays g6 here, trying to develop the bishop. Now, in this position, I play h3, just a quiet move, preventing black from playing bishop to g4 down the road. He goes bishop g7, and now I play rook d1. And at this point, you can kind of start to see why I've given up the bishop for the knight. Black has trouble pushing this pawn to d5, but additionally, on top of that, this pawn on d6 is very weak. I can even play bishop a3, or potentially stack these rooks on d2 and d1, and keep an eye on the pawn on d6. 
Indiger plays queen c7. I go bishop g5, and now he plays queen e7. Black could try to play knight d7 here, but now after rook to d2, black has some big issues here because if you castle the king, there are a couple ways for white to be much better. Probably the most simplistic one is to go bishop e7, attacking both this pawn and the rook at the same time, and black will lose some material here. So Indiger just plays queen e7, keeping an eye on the knight. The pin is not really a big deal because the pawn of c6 covers the square. And black can always just go h6 and say I play like a4, h6, for example. If I move away, there's no pin here. And if I go bishop h4, black can always play g5 to break the pin. So after queen e7, I play rook to d2. Simple move to stack the two rooks and go after this pawn on d6. Indiger just plays h6, and now I go bishop to e3. I do want to keep this bishop on the board because it's keeping an eye on both of these pawns here, and there's no reason to trade off for this knight. Castles is played. I go rook a d1, stacking the two rooks on d2 and d1, and now we get rook f d8, and here I play this move knight to g3. Now, knight to g3 is a move. I don't know if it's the best move. Basically, at this point, I wasn't really sure how to keep building up pressure. Black is guarding this pawn on d6 with the queen and the rook. I don't really have any way to put pressure on this pawn because knight b5 is not a move here. If I go c5, black will just play d5 and get a big center. And so I just played knight g3 also because I'd love to move my queen and play f4, but if I go queen g3 right away, black can actually play knight h5. And now I, maybe I can go queen h2, but the queen looks very weird in the corner here. It doesn't look like it's doing a whole lot. It's eyeing the pawn, I guess, but it's just kind of awkwardly placed. So I played knight g3 at, because I wanted to maybe move my queen backwards. We get b6 being played here. Now black has to make a choice. He'd love to move the rook and say play rook a d8, but then you would lose his pawn on a7. Additionally, if you try to play if you try to play a move like a6, for example, now white can go a5, and after rook a d8, there are moves like bishop to b6, for example, or even moves like knight to a4 with the idea of knight to b6, and you get a great outpost here. You also still kind of prevent black from being able to push the pawn in the center of the board. So Indiger plays b6 here, basically trying to prevent me from being able to attack the pawn, and he wants to put the rooks in the center of the board. So here I play a4 here, and this is just a move that's basically designed to prevent black from ever playing b5 or d5. He goes rook a b8, and now I play rook d3 here, and he goes knight to e8. Now at this point, it's really hard to come up with an active plan for black, whereas I have a very straightforward plan. Either I'm going to play something like, let's just say king h8, where I can go rook d2 and queen d1, and we create what's called the triple stack, or aliak. This actually isn't the technical term for aliak and gun, because normally the queen is between the rooks, but you have the three pieces lined up on this file towards the pawn and the rook. And additionally, I can also play the other way, which is I can go queen to e2 with the idea of playing a move like queen to d2. Again, this is Ali Ekin's gun where I target the pawn, but also the pawn on h6 is very weak here. And of course, last but not least, it is a right triangle. So here, Indigich plays knight e8 to guard the pawn. I go queen to e2, plays queen to h4, and now I play this move queen d2. Now, this is a big mistake by me, as I realized almost as soon as I played it, because here, black can actually play this very tricky move, pawn to f5. The knight guards this pawn in the center of the board, and I don't have a good response to this move f4, forking the bishop and the knight. If I move my knight back, black simply goes f4 here, and the bishop is trapped. I have no squares for the bishop to go to, so I simply lose the bishop. If I try to take, for example, and play f4, now I actually hang this knight on g3, and I'm in a lot of trouble as well. So if this had happened, I would have been in bad shape. Probably what I would have done is played knight c to e2, and after f4, I would have taken and taken with the knight. And computer actually doesn't think this is that bad, because after bishop f7, for example, I have knight to f5, and with these knights and the rook being able to swing over to g3, there is some pressure. Black's rooks are also very, very passive here. And I can even go rook e1 and rook e3, and with this open e file, there is some counterplay, but it still is preferable for black. So fortunately for me, this didn't happen, so I didn't have to make this tough decision. Indigis plays rook d c8, and the reason for this move was because he was worried that if he plays a move like king h7, I could now maybe go c5 here. Black cannot capture the d-pawn, because after all the trades on this d8 square, I end up with one extra rook. So he played rook, d he played rook d c8 simply to try and dodge the c5 idea. So here I play knight c to e2, and now my idea is that I guard the knight, I can play f4. Black still doesn't really have these pawn pushes of d5, I simply win the, win the trade. And if black goes b5, I also can take on a7 potentially, or just trade first and then take this extra pawn on the a7 square. So black still doesn't have either of these pawn breaks, and now I'm preparing to play f4 because the knight on e2 guards the knight on g3. Indigich plays king h7, now I go f4, he has to take, and I take back with the bishop. 
and he plays bishop to e5 trying to prevent me from winning this pawn on the d6 square no black is very very passive here and he's got a lot of issues but if he can trade the bishop on e5 for example while the computer still likes white here the knights don't have great squares f5 and h5 squares are covered by this pawn this knight can't go to d4 f4 because the pawn covers them if you go back to c3 you still don't have any jumps because the, the d5 and b5 squares are covered by the pawn on c6 so these knights are not really all that great so here I play rook f1 and the reasoning is now, now black has really over defended this pawn on d6 but I have an open f file as well which I can use and I'm going to try to crash through by stacking on this file so we get bishop to g7 and now I go bishop to e3 I do not take this pawn on d6 because after takes takes and rook d8 for example it's a very similar situation here where even though white has an extra pawn on e4 the bishops are going to be really really well placed on e5 and e6 again the knights don't have great squares and the bishops control all the critical squares in the center of the board and black also will probably have control over this open d5 so instead I play bishop to e3 here and the reason I did this is because I really wanted to play this move knight to d4 here but I was concerned that that my opponent could trade on d4 and then play this odd move g5 because now I have a problem with the bishop and the knight if I move the bishop back he simply captures the knight and I'm down a piece I can't really move it here if I go here and he takes and I take back he simply wins the knight anyway so my bishop really has no good squares to go to and I'm going to lose some material now oddly enough computer actually says that after takes apparently this great move queen d3 is winning because now if black moves the knight I have e5 creating a fossil where the king is in check and I win the queen and I guess if black moves the king here I go e5 anyway and I win the knight or the queen here and I win the game again pretty random and not something that I saw at the time and I was also trying to move very quickly in this game because my opponent was low on time so when your opponent is really low on time here where you have an extra minute you don't want to give him obvious moves if I take and he takes back he has obvious moves he's up a piece and if I don't have a killer blow or I can't spot it I will lose this game so instead of taking I decided instead of taking on d6 I decided to go bishop to e3 here um, and now he plays queen to e7 and now I go bishop d4 the reasoning being here that I still want to trade the bishops but from the d4 square if black plays bishop to e5 I have other options now again you'll notice that here again let's disregard even the fact that black can take if black were to be able to go bishop d7 and let's just say I play king h1 he gets bishop e5 the only great square I have for the knight is potentially f3 now in this exact position it's very good but conceptually speaking it's not as clear that the knight on f3 is going to be great let's just say we put in some random moves like we got some position like this while white is much better it's not clear cut where the breakthrough will be now obviously this is just an example so in the game you'll see the bar gives white a huge edge but that's not the purpose of what I'm saying so the reasoning behind this is that now when we get to this position after bishop e5 I can actually go knight to f4 and now my bishop is still threatening to trade off but my knight on f4 is very well placed to execute some classic tricks on the f5 we get rook to d8 and now I go rook to f3 and the idea is very simple if black plays a6 for example I can take the bishop and with a double stack on the f line after pawn takes I have rook f7 check and I will win this queen on e7 so my opponent plays f6 here basically trying to hold everything together here with this bishop on e5 all the pawns the knight and the rook here now it's very easy here to get impatient be like man where's the win my opponent's so passive he's got all these pawns on the sixth rank I've got to double stack it feels like I should be in control but sometimes you have to exercise a lot of patience and not simply look for something that simplifies right away especially because at this point in the game I had 40 more seconds so here I play queen to f2 lining up another Ali Ekans gun on the f file we get bishop to f7 and now I bring my knight back to e2 maybe not necessary relative to what I was going to do anyway but I bring the knight back here and after rook b7 I put this knight on d3 and now you can tell the black has a lot of problems here with all of this pressure in the center of the board and all these pieces ganging up on this pawn on f6 and it just plays bishop g8 trying to remove the bishop and now I go bishop to e3 he goes queen g7 and now I put this knight on d4 now again I've sort of been maneuvering the pieces all around the board but in the process of doing that my opponent has made a lot of weaknesses if we go back like five or ten moves he's put the bishop on e5 but he's played f6 so now his knight is very very passive my knights are very very well placed here in the center of the board and I have a triple stack on the f file so patience is very very important here now fortunately for me my opponent blunders here and loses the game he plays rook to e7 obviously at this point he was under pressure down to 25 seconds and I think at this point he just thought well the pawn's under attack but white's also threatening 96 so probably what he saw was something like rook c7 96 and he assumed well it's a family fork I lose the game 
Of course, knight e6 is not possible because black simply captures the knight with the bishop. But I think that in the split second, he thought he just thought that knight e6 was a big threat. So he goes rook e7 and he cracks under the pressure, hanging the pawn on c6. And now I fork the rooks on e7 and d8. Rook d7 is played and the rest is pretty straightforward. But the main goal here is to simplify. So I trade and now I play a5 here. He takes and I go c5. Again, what am I trying to do? The, the precise moves don't matter that much. What matters here is that I trade off as many pieces as I can because I know that if you look at the pawns, the pawns are very, very mediocre for black. They're not going anywhere. So if I can trade off bishops, trade off some rooks, it doesn't matter what I give up in terms of pawns because I will be able to convert it later on. So I play c5, he goes a4, I take, he goes bishop c4, and now I take this bishop and he takes back. If he were to take the rook on f1, for example, I can go knight to g4 here, and the bishop is under attack, so he has to move the bishop. And after bishop takes h6, let's say queen e7 here, I can play bishop to g5. And again, everything is collapsing. If he takes the bishop, I check and win the queen. And if he doesn't take, well, if he plays, I don't even know, like takes, for example, I can simply go queen h4 check, king g7, and now after knight takes f6, everything is collapsing. If he trades the knights, he loses his queen here. If he doesn't, he plays like rook d1, king, king h2, and queen to d6, for example. I simply go rook f4, and I'm threatening mate on h7 in a couple of moves, so it's, it's just totally hopeless. So instead, he takes the knight. I go rook to b1, claiming the other open file here, because black currently controls the d file. We get rook to c8 being played here, and now I go queen to d2. Bishop to e6 is played, and I go rook ff1. Again, here I'm playing very simple moves. The idea is simply to control both of the open files because that is where rooks belong. We get g5. I go queen d3 here. Idea to just go queen a6 and infiltrate on the seventh rank. King g6 is played. I play queen to a6, queen to d7. And now I play this move, rook to b7. Indigich plays queen to six. I trade the queens because, again, there are many ways to win. But if I trade off queens, trade off rooks, I know that I will be able to win simply because of the pawn structure here. So now there's only one rook to get rid of. So here I take on a7. He goes rook c8. And now I play rook b1 to claim this open file. He goes bishop c4. And now I play rook b6. Idea, again, very simple. Just push the pawn forward, force mass trade. It's not about playing precise. It's not about being super precise and finding the absolute best line. It's about forcing trades. So I go rook b6, he plays h5, now I go c6, g4, we trade, and I go c7. Idea just to play rook b8. And at this point, it's totally hopeless. If black were to say take with the knight, I can simply go rook c6, winning the knight, the bishop, or the rook. And if he takes with the rook, I simply trade and go rook c6, winning either piece once again. And so he plays g3 here, but after rook b8, black does not have any open files to try and checkmate me on the back rank here. The pawn covers the, the eighth rank, the rook on a7 guards the pawn on c7, and it's all hopeless. The game continues with knight d6. We trade the rooks. I go rook to a8, bishop e6, and now I play a5. And here my opponent resigns the game. So I win this very clean game. It takes me up to a final score of 9.5 out of 11. Now, Ali Reza, as I think I mentioned earlier in this video, I don't remember if I did actually, but Ali Reza drew his last round game fairly quickly against Gata Kamsky, the former United States chess champion, which meant that all of our eyes were on the game that, were, that was being played between Buddy Pranav from India and Magnus Carlsen. So this game starts with e4, Buddy Pranav with the white pieces. Magnus plays e5, Magnus needing to win this game in order to win the event. Knight f3 is played, Magnus plays knight c6, and we get bishop b5, the classic Spanish. Magnus goes a6, bishop to a4, knight to f6, castles, bishop to e7, and now Buddy Pranav plays d3 here, and this is what we call the closed Spanish, because white tries to guard this pawn on e4, instead of perhaps trying to play something where he goes c3 and d4. One of the main lines in the Spanish is this b5, bishop b3, d6, c3, castles, h3, and black has many setups, but just one example, let's just say black plays bishop b7, white can play d4, and he gets this nice center with the pawns on e4 and d4. But when white plays d3 here, he's basically saying, I'm not going to be playing for d4. I'm going to be playing a much slower game where I'll, I'll try to do something like rook e1, knight bd2, something like knight f1, knight g3, and then maybe long term, I'll play c3 and d4, but it's nothing that I'm going for right away. So after d3, Magnus plays b5. We get bishop to b3, black castles, and now knight c3 is played here. Black would love to play knight a5, winning the bishop on b3. However, that does hang a pawn on e5 here. So Magnus plays d6, guarding the pawn, threatening to go knight a5 and get rid of this nasty bishop on the long diagonal. Buddy Pranav plays a3, so that now, after knight to a5, you can scoot the bishop back to a2, and is still keeping an eye on this long diagonal. Magnus plays h6, we get h3 being played here, and now rook to b8. 
bishop to e3, just developing moves. We get rook e8 and rook to e1 and bishop f8. Both sides, by the way, have played h3 and h6 for a couple of reasons. h3 prevents black from playing knight to g4 and targeting the bishop. h6 stops white from going knight g5 and putting pressure on this pawn on f7. So we get d4 being played. Magnus trades, and now he goes bishop to b7. We get knight to f5 here. Now, white apparently is quite a bit better after trade and bishop to a7, rook to a8, and bishop d4. Don't ask me why exactly, but I suspect that it's because the two bishops are for white are much better placed than the two bishops for black. And if you take on e4 here, you actually lose due to queen f3, threatening checkmate. Uh, maybe not checkmate, but winning a lot of material on f7. You drop back to cover the square. You lose the bishop. You play d5 to prevent the attack on f7 I simply trade and now after takes you lose the pawn anyway and the game and you don't really have any other moves if, if you move the knight like I said you just lose the pawn if you go back you lose the bishop so it's game over now of course this is a blitz game so perfect play is not going to happen we get knight to f5 played by buddy knight e5 played by magnus and now f3 consolidating the central pawn chain and with his knight on f5 and his bishop on b3 it looks like white is perhaps a little bit better Magnus continues with c5 here and a very simple plan that after bishop f2 c4 the white bishop is now on a2 but black has a pawn chain here and so the bishop on a2 is extremely passive game continues with d5 here from Magnus trying to open up this diagonal for the dark square bishop we get f4 knight to g6 e5 and now Magnus plays this move knight e4 now in a classical game there's a very good chance Magnus would find this crushing blow which is pawn to d4 and it's apparently really really strong because after pawn takes knight queen takes knight takes d4 black can play knight takes f4 and this g2 and h3 pawns are very very weak you have queen g6 as well and the computer really likes it so d4 is a very tough move to find Magnus plays knight e4 a much more human move because after the trade the bishop is still locked behind the chain it has no real no real threats we get queen g4 and now Magnus goes queen d2 h5 is a better move but again a very a very computerish move because now if white takes a pawn you'd lose this pawn and once you lose this pawn on f4 and black goes back now you lose the pawn on e5 so it's basically a two for one where you lose this chain in return for one pawn on the edge of the board which would of course be a great trade for black Magnus instead plays queen d2 buddy Pranav plays bishop e3 important move as well because if black could if black could somehow get this pawn to e3 for example now this diagonal opens up and potentially it could be very very scary for white so he goes bishop e3 and it sort of closes the idea of black ever being able to activate the bishop on this long diagonal we get queen takes pawn rook to e2 queen to a4 is played not queen to d3 by the way because after queen to d3 rook to d2 would trap the queen knight guards the bishop Queen simply has no squares to go to. It's just completely stuck. So queen to a4 is played. We get rook to f1 played by buddy. And now Magnus plays this move rook b to d8. Missing his really last opportunity to sort of stay in the game with this move bishop to c8, forcing a trade of the bishop for the knight. Now again, another thing that I've mentioned many times in videos is Gary Kasparov, the creator of chess, and one probably the number one or number two best player of all time one of his famous sayings is that a knight on f5 or f4 that cannot be removed is worth at least one pawn if not more so Magnus by playing rook bd8 instead of bishop c8 simply cannot defend the position anymore as you'll notice even though white has a bad bishop on a2 all of white's other pieces are very very close to this black king here you have the rooks on e2 and f1 knight the queen and the bishop and there are a lot of problems now after rook bd8 buddy Pranav plays knight takes h6 check pawn takes an f5 black cannot move this knight due to the pin from the queen magnus goes bishop c8 and now the crushing move e6 is played here by Pranav, blocking off this pin here you could not capture the knight right away because then you do a botez gambit and lose your queen so we get e6 here breaking the diagonal and magnus plays this move rook to d1 what magnus probably should have tried was to play bishop takes e6 but after pawn takes rook takes and rook to f2 the double stack rooks are really really hard to defend against this f7 pawn is very weak if you play a move like rook d7 you simply lose on the spot due to rook takes pawn rook takes rook queen takes rook you're pinned you have to go back to guard the rook and after bishop to b1 here all of your pieces are very very passive white is going to be able to activate both of these bishops and you're going to have a lot of issues so Magnus probably should have tried something like this again after rook f2 maybe you can try rook e7 even but even this is probably just lost because the queen takes knight rook g7 queen to e6 check and after king h7 takes king g8 probably you go check king h7 and then 
probably you actually just take here and after king h8 for example you can even go bishop to b1 and now once again the queen and the two bishops with the rook on f1 are very well placed black's queen is completely out of the game on this side of the board it's just doing nothing it's sitting in the sun not doing anything at all so magus has said tries to play rook d1 but this simply loses immediately because pranav takes on f7 we get king takes pawn queen takes knight check pawn guards the queen king to e7 and now we get bishop c5 check king to d8 and now bishop b6 check king to d7 not king to e7 by the way because then white will take this pawn and after king d7 queen takes e8 would be checkmate king simply has no squares or actually wait no king is d6 sorry what am i saying but after king d6 you go rook e6 king d5 queen c6 checkmate and if black takes the rook with the bishop you simply take with the queen king is completely stuck in the middle of the board so Magnus plays king d7 trying to avoid going to the e file but now we get pawn to b3 another brutal move here as this breaks the coordination but to, between the queen and the rook if you were to take the rook right away after queen takes black is black is actually winning here but when you play b3 now the queen doesn't guard the rook the queen is under attack so if you take the pawn you just lose the rook pawn is in the way of the queen and if you move the queen I just win the rook as well so Magnus trades the rooks and he takes on b3 but now Pranav goes rook d2 rook on the open file here and Magnus Carlsen resigns this game because after king to e7 white goes bishop c5 which would be checkmate king is simply stuck in the middle of the board here it has no squares so what does this mean drum roll what this means is that now we have our final standings from the title Tuesday this evening where I did end up winning on tie breaks I scored nine and a half points out of 11 along with Ali Reza Farouja and Buddy Pranav also on nine and a half but as you can tell from the tie breaks my tie break was 81.5 Ali Reza's was 75.5 and Buddy Pranav's was 70.5 which means that I do end up winning title Tuesday and it is my 50th victory in title Tuesday which is pretty amazing considering the next closest competitors are Jeffrey Zhang and Dimitri Andraken who have both won a whopping 11 title Tuesdays so they have both won 39 less title Tuesdays than I have nonetheless I thought you guys would enjoy this recap of some of the games that I played tonight make sure to hit that subscribe button below if you've not already and I'll be back with some more great content in the very near future have a great one you guys bye